As the U.S. has lost our manufacturing base and as globalization continues, we've also lost a sense of how things are made. We can consider this presentation slide clicker since it's conveniently here in my hand. So this has plastic parts. Plastic comes from oil, which is processed at a petrochemical facility, turned into graded plastic pellets, then shipped to an injection molding facility. It includes a circuit board. Circuit boards use a substrate board of 9-9 silicon, also copper wires and potentially gold wires, which could have been mined from a place in the Congo, in which case they may have funded rebel groups that are wreaking havoc in that area. Final assembly probably happened at a different facility, probably in China, where workers who I hope weren't children put together the pieces, tested, and packaged it up. And speaking of packaging, this probably came in a cardboard box. Cardboard, of course, comes from trees. And I really hope that a rainforest wasn't clear cut somewhere to provide the raw materials for that box because it was probably thrown away as soon as it was opened. Then, of course, this had to get to me, involving another whole list of companies and steps and impacts. So even for relatively inexpensive things, it can get complex pretty quickly. I present it here as a root system of, of processes that result in an end product. I could create a similar root system for almost any product. This dress I'm wearing required cotton and dyes and knitting machines, individual labor. These shoes required tanned leather, wood, plastic stitching. The Diet Coke many of you may drink today involved rolled aluminum, dyes, water, and honestly, no one really knows what exactly is in a Diet Coke. <laughs> but as I started alluding to, a lot of the steps in this process could harm people or the environment. And this in turn poses significant risks for the businesses that make these products. Looking back at our clicker, it probably includes a battery. The lead acid battery manufacturing industry has been considered responsible for recent incidences of high levels of lead in people's blood in China. In 2013, the government released first nationwide regulations to control this industry, and as a result, 81% of all manufacturers had to shut down. This is a real impact of regulatory risk, and it's an issue for firms. I mentioned the Coke, the Coke many of you may drink. Last summer in India, Coca-Cola was forced to shut down a second bottling facility under accusations that it's unsustainably using area groundwater. Area groundwater. Um, another type of risk inherent in the supply chain is reputation risk, which is when a company could suffer from negative perceptions of its brand. Many dresses that look like mine could have been made from Angora rabbit wool. PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, launched a campaign to inform consumers of cruel wool gathering practices. And in February of this year, Inditex, the world's largest clothing manufacturer, owner of Zara and other brands, announced that it will stop sourcing Angora wool completely. It also then removed almost a million dollars worth of product from its inventory. There are many similar instances when companies change their practices because of reputational risk. And yet another danger lurking in this root system is strategic or industry risk. The chocolate industry depends on a supply of raw cocoa to turn into chocolate. But global yields have been falling due to outdated farming practices and poor soil conditions, and it's expected that the industry will be short 1 million tons of cocoa per year by 2020. One company very dependent on cocoa is Mars Chocolate. And if Mars can't get cocoa, then I may not be able to get M&Ms to give to my mom for Mother's Day tomorrow, and that is a potential crisis. <laughs> but all that hardness aside, there, these are very real risks presented in this root system. But we're still just talking about the roots. After all, this supports the tree and the main activity of these businesses. Inditex designs and makes and sells clothing. And while wool sourcing is important to them, raising rabbits is not and should not be their core focus area. While Coca-Cola is certainly a stakeholder in water issues, its primary focus is not and should not be to coordinate regional watershed management. And while cocoa is very important to Mars, its business is in creating and selling products, not in training rural farmers. Strategy is making choices, and companies should focus on their primary activities. But the risks inherent in this root system require expertise that's often far outside of these core areas. So what are companies to do? Either try to do it all and be stretched pretty thin, or ignore it and hope for the best. That's what many companies are doing, but I propose a better way. 
It turns out that there are organizations focused in exactly these risk areas I mentioned. I used to work for one of them. Here I am in what is, what is now South Sudan, talking with people who live there about water issues. My company drilled water wells, this stabilized communities, and brought significant direct benefits to businesses in that area. And by the way, this group was a nonprofit. There are entire organizations that exist exclusively to address the areas that are also business needs. There are groups for training farmers in sustainable practices, or managing watersheds, or advocating for worker rights in factories. And for almost any issue out there, there's a group of citizens or a social entrepreneur who is concerned about the issue and is acting on it. I propose that companies recognize and leverage the expertise in the nonprofit sector to better mitigate their risks and better manage their business. Now, when I start to mention business nonprofit partnerships, people often say, oh, yeah, my company does that. We, we donate to that charity for girls' education, and we have a tent at the 5K each summer, and we hand out water bottles. Like, these are nice ways for a company to engage its community. But I'm proposing something different. I'm proposing partnerships that start with an operational need in the business. This is different from corporate philanthropy, which is where a company donates to a charity. And this is very different from cause marketing, which is where a company leverages the equity of a nonprofit's brand to sell more product and also to generate donations for the firm, or for the nonprofit. These are very worthwhile engagements, but again, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm proposing a true operations based partnership where the company starts with a business need and then finds the outside expertise in a nonprofit that can meet that need. These types of arrangements are great for business because, as we've said, they allow the business to focus on its core activities. They're also great for nonprofits because if a nonprofit is providing value to a firm, they should be compensated, and this outside revenue stream enables the nonprofit to do what it wants to focus on. And of course, it's great for the people at the end of the chain who are now enabled to live better lives. So if this is so great, then are people doing it? And if companies are trying it, does it work? I've been thinking about this issue for a long time, including through time spent working at a large corporation, also at a nonprofit, through time spent writing for a newspaper that covers the nonprofit sector, and through two years in business school. I've researched and talked to people here in the US, and I also spent several months on the ground in Asia this past winter, visiting factories and meeting and talking with companies, nonprofits, and practitioners. And yes, I found companies engaged in what I would term operations-based partnerships, and they're having amazing results. Remember Coca-Cola and its water issues? Dow Chemical has had similar challenges managing water near its plants. It also needed a way to better account for and value natural resources in its financial planning and operations. It turns out there's a nonprofit for that. The Nature Conservancy specializes in exactly this and has hundreds of scientists on its staff that focus on managing and planning for natural resources. Dow went through an internal process to determine its business needs, identified the Nature Conservancy, and the two have been working together since 2011. And as Dow rolls out its learning across its global footprint, it expects to earn over a billion dollars in business value by 2025. You've probably heard how companies are on the hook for labor conditions in factories in Asia. Burberry is just one of these companies. It now partners with the Handshake Worker Hotline, a local Chinese nonprofit that runs a help center and hotline for employees at factories where Burberry sources product. Sure, Burberry could have set up a help center on its own, but the local nonprofit is much better able to build trust with workers. Burberry benefits by finding out about issues early on. And the workers benefit by having a place to go if things become unsafe or if hours exceed legal limits. There are many similar partnerships right now on the ground in Asia, and this space continues to evolve. And I know you haven't forgotten Mars chocolate and its cocoa. And actually, if you look under your seats right now, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you all were awake. Um, cocoa is very important to Mars, <laughs> and they have developed an in-house expertise on sustainable cocoa raising techniques. They now partner with the Reed program in a joint venture sponsored by IFAD, a UN agency. 
This joint venture trains farmers in sustainable techniques, and it's resulted in increased yields and also increased income for the farmers, and also a reliable supply of cocoa for Mars. I talked to representatives from IFAD just last week about this partnership, and they're so impressed with the results that they're actively trying to expand it to different regions. And Mars agreed. They recently announced an expanded version of this program, now with other major brands on board and with other local implementing nonprofits that will reach 58,000 farmers in Indonesia. So researching in this space has been incredibly exciting because I keep coming across companies and nonprofits doing amazing work together. The examples I mentioned are just few of many out there, and I am confident in saying that Yes, these partnerships do exist, and they are working across different industries and across geographies. And not only do they work, but they can scale, bringing real value to businesses and to the people involved. So why isn't everybody doing them? Well, more companies are doing them than you'd think. It's just that they aren't often advertised heavily because companies are still working through the kinks, and also because PR isn't the point. But it's true that these partnerships are not just business as usual. So why is that? It's because we're stuck in this mindset that if a nonprofit is involved, it must be the recipient of a donation, or at best a partner for a marketing campaign or, or an event. It just doesn't often occur to someone in purchasing or HR or financial planning or product management that their outcomes could be improved by leveraging expertise that's found in the nonprofit sector. So let's get out of this mindset. Let's realize that you do not need to work for a company foundation or for a social responsibility group to engage the nonprofit sector. There are so many opportunities to make things better by building successful partnerships. And I bet that you could find some in your own work. If your business generates some excess waste that you aren't sure of how to best dispose of, there's probably a nonprofit that can help you with either use the product or find a more safe way to dispose of it. If you run a hotel and you have a lot of vacancies at a certain time of year, why not partner with a local birders group or chamber music ensemble and see what happens? If you're having a hard time finding good employees for your small business, try partnering with a local group that provides job training for homeless veterans who really want a job. If you, part of your production uses a raw material or a component and you aren't completely sure where it comes from, then look into it. It's very possible that an industry group or coalition already exists that's addressing that very area. If you work for an insurance company and you're having a hard time finding quality care for autistic children of families in your member network, then find the nonprofit that cares about caring for autistic children and pay them to do what you need, which, by the way, is what they most love to do. So, of course, not every problem can be solved by a nonprofit. I mean, sometimes you're going to need an accountant. But if you think about how your business could use outside expertise to mitigate risks or to gain access, clarity, or growth opportunities, then it's likely that a nonprofit could be involved. So, to conclude, I've talked a lot today and couched these arguments in terms of business risk and the value they can provide. And these justifications are useful in business strategy or budgeting meetings. But it's about a lot more than that. The reason any of this is worth doing is because of people. Real people are affected by this. These people are consumers who can buy things confidently without worrying that they contributed to something, far, something horrible far away. Um, these people are employees at your firm. Because, by the way, the number one thing employees care about is having a sense of purpose, and this can help provide that. These people are also the staff that work at nonprofits who are now enabled to do what they are most, most passionate about doing. And these people are the millions of men and women out there in the wide world who are involved in this extensive process of making and sourcing our stuff. Successful partnerships can make a real enduring difference in the life of a real person, like this guy who I met at a final assembly plant in southern China. He now works reasonable hours and can, has a day off each week to spend with his new daughter. Successful partnerships can make a real difference in the lives of people like this guy, farmer Ahmad Derise in Indonesia, who says he almost gave up on cocoa farming before benefiting from the Mars Initiative. He now says, when I look at my fruit, I feel happy. 
I want to send my children to college. I have big dreams. Successfully building partnerships is work worth doing. So let's get to it. Thank you very much to everyone who helped him with, with this research. Thank you for being here today. I'm sorry there's no chocolate. And enjoy the rest of the talks. Thanks.